In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. My beloved, welcome back to our Christian marriage series. Uh, so far we have uh, discussed the introduction and then from there we uh, uh, imagined uh, a construction of a building where it has a foundation and then pillars in the first floor and in the second floor we have uh, agreed to go into uh, specific rooms where we discuss the day-to-day -day life. Um, so in the foundation um, uh, lecture we have discussed that we lay the foundation of our Christian human marriage based on the idea that God has planned to have a committed covenant marital relationship with our human souls. And that's a deep idea where we uh, base and found our human marriage on. Today when we are going to discuss the, the second two pillars after love and respect, we're going to discuss the other two uh, pillars, trust and cooperation. We start from the fact that without trusting in God and faith in Him and belief that He is our heavenly groom, we can't really have a relationship with Him. So the same applies to trust in the spousal relationship. We say that without faith, no one can please God. The same applies to the relationship between the two spouses. Without trust, there cannot be a good relationship. Trust is the, uh, the glue of relationships in general. And even uh, the psychologists, the scientists, they have discovered, for example, there is this person named Eric Erickson, who gave um, like eight stages of psychosocial developments for the human being. He starts off by age zero to one a year. Uh, the, the person goes on to either uh, be, uh, to, to either have trust versus mistrust. So we know from that scientist that trust is a very basic um, need in which the human being has to develop in order to have a good relationship with the humanity, with the world. The same applies to marriage. It's, trust is fundamental in marriage. And what does uh, trust entail? Trust entails so many very important things, like we trust each other in marriage. Uh, we trust ourselves to each other. We trust emo our emotions to each other. We trust our money. We trust um, um, our secrets, our promises. Without trust, we can't have a, a deep relationship. It becomes fake. It becomes very unpredictable. When we have that deep trust in each other, uh, it results in a relationship of peace, comfort, and support to each other. However, sometimes the fact is that we go through periods of times where this trust is shattered or broken. And uh, that throws the relationship into chaos. Fear starts to get in, anxiety, depression, pain, trauma. Because if, God forbid, that trust was shattered, now how can we relate to each other? We can start thinking about the, the depth of the relationship, the meanings of all the history that we have, and the future and the current status, it becomes a very uh, bitter moment. Uh, the question is how to regain trust when it is shattered. Uh, well, we discussed before the uh, items of the effective apology, and I want to re refer back to it, that at least when, when there is a shattered trust, there has to be an expression of honest, true regret from the person who committed the, the problem. And also it has to be followed up by a clear explanation of what, what went wrong. Also an acknowledging, acknowledgement of responsibility. Also a declaration of repentance and a promise of repair. And then a request for forgiveness. Sometimes it's very hard for the other uh, spouse to accept that or uh, move on. And that's when the Christian forgiveness uh, helps um, and uh, Christ himself reassures that person that he will be the support, he will be the repairer of this relationship and the other partner starts to, based on his or her relationship with Christ, to uh, accept the, the, the repentance, accept the regretness and forgive the other person. So here I want to discuss with you the idea of forgiveness in Christianity and how much effective it could be in these situations. Because a lot of us struggle with how to forgive. 
the forgiveness in, in Christ is based on Christ himself, not based on the repentant. Christ himself took our sufferings. So when we have a relationship with him, we believe that he will take his, our sufferings and he will give us a new relationship, a, a newness of life, newness of, uh, of, of, of the soul, the broken soul. And this, this little idea is very important in uh, fixing the traumatic experience. Uh, as a psychiatrist, I've treated so many people with psychogenic trauma and the person who has trauma is very hard to, to, uh, to fix these traumas. Only in Christ that we have the idea of not only fixing what was broken, as the world would see it, but burying the old self and renewing a new life. Because when Christ came, he didn't try to fix our shattered soul, but he actually took it on himself, buried it, and he gave us a new man uh, in Christ. Uh, so the idea of Humpty Dumpty fell and uh, fell off the wall and was broken and nobody can repair him, not, not in Christ. Christ can actually bury the whole Humpty Dumpty thing and give us a new one in him. So before we leave the, the pillar of trust, I want to just allude to a pathological disorder uh, that we f see a lot in psychiatry. It's called a delusional disorder. And sometimes this disorder uh, can impact on the human brain in a pathological way and, and make the person have a pathological distrust of the other um, and a sense of paranoia. And that can happen and we see it a lot. So I would just want to highlight the fact that some, some of us can have an, uh, a pathological way of thinking where they, they feel that they are betrayed, they are, um, that there is infidelity or something like that and it's, it's pathological. Um, the problem is that it, it, it becomes very real to that person. So I just want to put it out there that if you have a suspicion uh, that is um, uh, overwhelming towards the, uh, the other person, um, think that there is a condition like that and it has very good treatments. The last pillar I wanted to talk about is called cooperation. Now, God, the Lord, uh, when he created Adam and Eve, he's, Adam in the beginning, he's, he looked at Adam and said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So that was actually the first time God would say, it is not good about something. Before that, he has said, it is good, it is good, it is good. But when he looked at Adam alone, uh, he uh, said that it's not good that he stays alone because human beings are social beings and I... Uh, need to create to him a comparable helper, comparable to him, to help him. And that idea is very uh, fundamental in our marriages. Uh, the marriages are made for the spouses to complement each other, to complete each other. The idea is not that uh, the two spouses has to be compatible or um, similar. The idea, on the contrary, is that God has intended for the two to be different but complement each other. And in doing that, they resemble the image of God who has the Trinitarian persons complementing and working with each other, even though they are one nature, but they are complementing each other in their functions. Um, so based on that idea, the marriage should be based on friendship, uh, the idea of helping each other, the idea of accompanying each other in everything. Like the book of Ecclesiastes says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 10. So the idea of complementing, we will discuss in later um, sessions in the specific rooms. We will discuss complementing each other in the roles of the two spouses in parenting, in finances, in their personalities, and in their spirituality. So with that, I will leave you and we'll see you next time. God willing, glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.